Thank you. So my talk is going to be a lot less entertaining than Bubbles, I'm afraid. But uh, hopefully you'll uh, find it interesting in terms of learning things about uh, energy generally. Uh, I think energy, uh, for me, it's a passionating, it's a uh, fantastic subject. Uh, a lot of people think energy is boring, and they're not really sure what it's used for. I think it's one of the three major challenges that humanity will face in the next 50 years. You can count food, water, and energy as the three main challenges. And uh, I'm uh, passionate about this subject, which may sound a little bit boring. Um, even though I'm a woman and I was one of the 18% um, executives in an energy company with a lot of uh, men in a very male-dominated environment, it's been absolute fun. I learned a huge amount, and I want to share some of that knowledge with you, uh, hopefully to make a better energy future going forward. So energy, you may, most people may think about electricity in the home. Maybe they might think about you know, the, the petrol you put in your car to go from one place to the next. Um, yes, you need it to charge your computer, your phone, what else, where else do you need use power? What a lot of people tend to forget is we, we need power for heating the home. We also need it to cool things down in your fridge to keep your food nice and fresh. We even need it to power showers. What would we do without power? We take it completely for granted in the western side of the world. So where does it come from? Historically, it's come mostly from three main sources, which are oil, the, the black part of the pie, gas, which is the light gray, and then carbon, which is the dark gray. If you look at nuclear in red, hydro in blue, and renewables, that's only something like 15, 18% of the sources of energy. Why should we care? It's, the world is fine as it is, right? So why should we care about that? Well, both oil and coal have been much more difficult and expensive to find. So if you look at the chart that's uh, the colorful chart, and if you look at all the different layers, I'm not going to go through them, but um, if you look at 10 years ago, about 50% of our oil was coming from Western countries. So it's the, the, the red, the dark, the pink, the red, all that was coming from Western US, Europe, those kind of countries. If you look at where the oil has been coming for, from in the last 10 years and where it's now 70, 80% coming from, it's the Middle East, it's um, places like Venezuela, Russia. So it's coming from places that are less stable with a lot more uncertainty. And that has been driving on the right-hand side, top side, the price of oil from about $15 a barrel in 1994 to about $120 a barrel in 2010. So you can see the difference in the cost that it has made to our lives. Now, we pay, we use it a little bit. We, you can see it in your petrol. You can see it less in your gas and electricity bills, but it has an impact. On the bottom left corner, you can see an open um, coal mine, and it's, you can see flames there. And that's because it naturally combusts uh, with the atmosphere. You can see also some children taking the uh, coal from the coal mine to uh, transportation locations. Not a necessarily a very easy and nice uh, place uh, to be to, to get that energy. And then on the bottom right, you can see that in 1994, we had to go one mile under the sea level to find oil. Today, we have to go three miles under the sea level to find that oil. So yes, there is still plenty of oil, gas, and coal, but it just is becoming more expensive and more difficult to find. The other thing is, most of you have heard about climate change. Is it a scientist, you know, just scientists coming up with this? Is it real? How does it impact me? Well, just a, a little picture. The green line uh, of this aerial picture of the um, polar uh, ice cap, shows the average minimum between 1979 and 2010. So 30 years, this is where 
the average minimum was. 2012, you can see where the ice cap is. So it's visible. I think there's a lot less debate now about climate change happening. But most people are thinking, OK, climate change is happening. What does it mean to me? Does it really matter? You know, maybe I won't see the difference in my lifetime. It might happen to my grandchildren, but, yeah, you know, um, I'll live through it. Well, think again. Today, it has an impact. You see at the top here two pictures of Beijing and Mexico City, the amount of smog. Well, in t by 2050, people expect that 10,000 people each day will die from pollution in cities. That's quite a lot, I would say. Um, if you look at the pictures that are in the middle, you can see some children studying at night. They are studying under lampposts because they don't have any power at home. In reality, 1.6 billion people do not have power today. Um, that's one person out of four on the planet. So all the things we take for granted and we enjoy, they don't have. We talked earlier about how fair the world is and what that crea that's creating in terms of reactions from extremists um, and you know, things of that nature. You can see it in, in pictures like this. The other thing you can see on the bottom left corner is a lady who's cooking dinner inside of her house. She's doing it on biomass. The reality is 2.5 billion people today do their cooking on biomass. That means also that 4,000 people each day die from indoor air pollution, indoor, just because they're cooking inside. The, other, the last picture on the right, bottom right is some children getting water. They don't have any power to pump it anywhere. Uh, they don't have any power to filter it, to clean it. You know, this is what happens in other parts of the world. So maybe um, you know, this picture gives you a little bit of a sense of why we should care maybe even about climate change and about clean energy today and having maybe a f fairer access to energy around the world. So you know, a little bit of humor. Who is going to save the day? And I'd like to hear from people here, what do, what do you think are the solutions? How do you think we can solve this problem of getting cleaner and, and cheap energy to more people around the world? Any views, any ideas? Thank you. Cultivation? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? And I think there are a lot of ideas. Sorry? Say that again. No cars. No cars. That's going to be hard. How are you going to get to school? <laughs> or to shop or to a lot of places. I think it's a great idea, but I think people will continue to need energy. We just need to make it more accessible, still cheap, and cleaner. Um, so that's the, the key. I'm going to talk about two that, were, that people came up with. I heard solar, I heard wind. I'm just going to talk about those two. Uh, because I'm passionate about those two, but there are lots of other solutions. What's happened, the top graph shows the explosion of installed PV capacity. It's gone tremendously up. So it's not, maybe not that visible in everyday life, but there's a lot of solar capacity being installed around the world. And at the bottom graph is the wind power. Those two have grown up tremendously. And there's two advantages to solar and wind. One is they're very quick to install. It takes only a couple years to put to up a power plant from wind or from solar, whereas for a thermal plant, it takes five to six years, a nuclear plant, seven years. So if you're short of power, you're in an emerging country or you really need power quickly, this is faster. That's one advantage. The other advantage is that you can use it in remote places that are not connected to the grid. So it's a really a good off-grid solution. Now, a lot of people here might think, hey, OK, now, that's nice, nice talk, et cetera. But you know, it's expensive, these things, right? So can we really afford them? And can you implement them in emerging markets? Well, in reality, and these graphs are a little bit complicated, so I'll explain them. The top graph shows 
the progression of the cost of installing solar. If you look at that line and uh, the, the declining cost of implementing solar until a line which is horizontal line. The first horizontal line is showing basically the retail cost of gas. So as you can see on this, today we're reaching that level on solar. That means the cost of solar is coming very close to the retail cost of gas. The second line below that is retail cost based on coal. And if you are in between those two lines, you're basically getting to the point that is being called grid parity, which means that basically solar is in between those two lines would be competitive with carbon-based sources. So that's supposed to happen between now and 2017, say. In some places in the world, it already is. In Italy, in California, in some places, it's already competitive. Bottom chart is showing the same thing for wind, a bit more difficult to maybe to understand. On the left-hand side of the graph, the white portion is places that are not yet competitive. In the blue area, it's places where it is competitive. And you can see that there are some countries with a nice pink bubble where wind is actually cheaper than coal and gas. And the, though that number of countries is increasing as we have high level of oil prices and as we have declining cost in both wind and solar. So it is becoming a lot more affordable. So what does the future look like? In terms of gas and renewables, you can see that the top three lines, oil and coal, are declining over time. Between 2010 and 2030, so the next 20 years, we'll see a reducing share of both oil and coal in our energy mix. And I have to say, this slide is made by an oil company. Okay, So maybe they're underestimating a little bit the, the portion of renewables. On the bottom side, you can see hydronuclear and renewables growing, but mostly gas and renewables are growing very fast to reach um, between the cleaner sources, something closer to 25 versus the 15 we're at today. So it's a big increase. And then on, on the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that the red bar and the green bar also growing a lot faster than they have in the past. So there's clearly a departure versus the past of both gas and renewables accelerating growth and bringing more clean energy into the world. Now, you may think, okay, that's great, it's declining, it's getting better, but you know, all these images you showed me were all about the uh, developing world and what happens in the developed world. In reality, there is a problem also in the developed world because there's a lot of old capacity, particularly in coal, but also in gas, that is now coming to the end of its life and needs to be replaced. And if you read the papers a bit, you would see that a lot of people have been talking about blackouts in places like the UK, in places like Europe or the US, coming to us in the next 10 to 20 years. So this is not just a problem of people who need more energy somewhere else in the world. It's also a problem for us in the Western world. What does do, do uh, solar and wind look like in a system? On the top, you can see a boat powered by solar panels. I think what's more exciting is those innovative architects that are coming up with uh, very energy neutral buildings where you have solar panels on top, wind turbines in the middle, we have energy efficient building and materials. And then here we have a home that's linked with a storage system that has a hybrid vehicle that has solar panels on top and, and a wind farm. What do we need for these things to start happening? I think we need creative, innovative ideas. We need scientists, we need architects, we need people who come up with those, all those innovative ideas. And we also need the general population to stop saying, hey, those wind turbines are ugly. I mean, look at the picture there. In between the top three, uh, you know, between a solar park, wind farm, and the, the thermal station in the middle, which one do you think looks uglier? I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> so, and this is my final slide. If you look, the, the pictures, the three pictures on the left, Pakistan, flooding, drought in India, you know, that's the effect of climate change. On the right-hand side, people studying at night next to a lantern, 
people cooking with open fires and based on biomass? You know, are we ready to do something? Are you ready to be creating the future for energy? Are you going to be creating those solutions, being innovative? Are you going to be part of the problem or part of the solution? Thank you. <laughs>